Interest in understanding one's family connections and history has grown dramatically over the past several years, propelled by DNA testing and accelerated by pandemic-driven increased interest in family. In fact, over 18 million Americans are estimated to be actively researching their family history, and over 30 million people globally have taken genealogical DNA tests. I'm Hans Olsen, Chief Investment Officer of Fiduciary Trust. It is my interest in tracing family heritage that brings me here today. We often find that our clients seek to understand their family's history, in part to help pass the family values down to the next generation. I'm joined by Brenton Sinens, President and CEO of American Ancestors, also known as the New England Historic Genealogical Society, or NEHGS. And he's a leading expert on genealogy. In today's conversation, we'll discuss what are the benefits of understanding your family's roots? Is DNA testing right for you? And how can you best use these results? What are the best ways to go about uncovering your family history and what are some of the pitfalls to avoid in this process? I'll also discuss some of my own experiences uncovering my own family history. Thank you for joining today, Brendan. I'm pleased to be here. Now let's start with the motivation and benefits of understanding one's family story through the generations. Brendan, what do you see driving people to uncover their roots? And tell us a bit about what role American Ancestors plays in helping people with that journey? Well, we all have an innate curiosity about who we are and where we came, come, came from. And so this is something that occurs at some point in everyone's life. And so one of, the, one of the benefits is to make those discoveries, to make those connections to the past. But just as you said, we look towards families to pass down legacies, to think of stories that they can pass to younger generations. And so we view this as a, a multi-generation enterprise. We work with grandparents and parents and grandchildren and help investigate the stories of where people came from, uh, what their lives were like. And this is one of the most rewarding activities a family can undertake. And there's a lot of evidence now, too, that it helps young people uh, be more secure and have greater poise and greater self-confidence if in school, especially if they've been introduced to genealogy as an activity. So there are a lot of benefits to it. And here at our society, uh, we were founded 175 years ago as New England Historic Genealogical Society, today better known as American Ancestors. We have more than 340,000 members uh, throughout the United States and in 138 countries. And we serve them and millions of online users with 1.6 billion records at AmericanAncestors.org. But that's just a small piece of what we do. We also publish books, family histories. We take on research cases for clients. Uh, we educate people. We have more than 200 education programs a year. Uh, many of those now are on online programs, so you can uh, learn from the comfort of home. Uh, and in non-pandemic times, we offer tours and experiences for people to connect with their family history, both in this country and abroad. So those are some of the things we do to uh, help uh, promote the discipline of family history. I know that your uh, uh, offices in, are in the center of Boston. They're in the beautiful business, uh, building in Back Bay, Boston. And I would encourage everyone, uh, if they are in Boston, to, to stop by because they really are spectacular facilities. Um, Brenton, let's move to uh, genealogical DNA testing. There's been a, uh, this has been a hot area in recent years. Uh, you know, five years ago, there had been a few million uh, people cumulatively taking uh, these tests, and now that figure has grown to over 30 million. How, could, how, how do you describe, uh, or could you describe what DNA testing is, what's involved in the test, and, and, and really, at the end of the day, what can you learn from it? Well, it is something that has just exploded and really is an important part of our culture now. And um, human beings share DNA to a very high extent. But there's a 
percent of our DNA makeup uh, that includes variants. And it's those variants that we study when we take a test with, say, Ancestry DNA or 23andMe or one of the other commercial DNA testing companies. And those variants allow us to investigate who are we related to, who are we descended from, uh, even our ethnic makeup. Um, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's really an amazing experience to delve into both your immediate family connections and then deeper earlier genetic connections. Um, one of the things that happens when you take a test and, and you asked about how it's done, it's done with usually a saliva sample, which you mail to the company. And you get as part of the results package uh, information on your paternal and your maternal family uh, haplogroups. And I won't get, I won't get bore you with the, all of the science here, but, uh, but it gives you that information, specific information on your paternal and maternal families. And that's going to be the same from test company to test company. What's going to vary a little bit from company to company is your ethnic makeup. Uh, so for example, in my own case, one of the testing companies just revised its modeling. And so while I know I'm primarily English and French and Dutch, it actually showed in this last test result a spike in Scottish ancestry for me and then a higher degree of Scandinavian, namely Swedish uh, family history than I would have expected. So it is can be very revealing and people love taking it and uh, so we encourage people to do it. And one of the things we offer here is a service to help interpret the results. What do they actually mean? What can you learn from it? So, so it's something I recommend to everyone. And now the tests are inexpensive enough that many people will test not just with one company, but across a couple of different companies. And I know you've been tested. What was, what was your experience, Hans? Well, Brent, my uh, early uh, interaction with uh, DNA testing was, was somewhat uh, questionable. When I uh, did the test, sent it in, I was waiting weeks for the response, and what I got was not what I was expecting to get. I got a note that apparently after repeated tries, they couldn't get any of my DNA, which made me think, there it is, I am the missing link. Uh, but upon a second try, I was successful. And, the, and what I got back was kind of interesting. As my name suggests, I thought I was mostly Scandinavian. It turns out that, that I'm not. I'm not only about 15% Scandinavian. What I am is mostly English uh, and Scottish, um, with a little bit of Welsh, apparently. Um, so it actually was quite interesting, and it spurred me on to, to want to know more. After I received these results, this is when I reached out to uh, American ancestors to help me go deeper. Uh, Brendan, could you outline the options for researching one's family history? Well, I, first of all, I'm delighted to hear we were able to help you. And there are quite a range of services that we offer. And it can be interpreting DNA test results, uh, taking a research case for many people. They've begun the process, but they don't know how to uh, pursue certain lines that may be difficult. Uh, for others, it may be researching all of their family history, documenting uh, every lineage, gathering stories, interviewing family members. And for some of our uh, members, we even produce full-scale genealogies. One of the things we're really proud of, and we are the premier publisher of in the country, are of compiled genealogies. And so we undertake these for families, and we produce beautiful books. This is one uh, we recently produced that has won a national award. Uh, but there are many examples of family histories that we can uh, publish. And, uh, and so that's just a sample of what we do. And for anyone who's interested, it's easy to contact our research staff and they can work up an estimate for you and develop a plan. And uh, Lindsay Fulton is the head of that area and she can be contacted by email at research at nehgs.org. 
You mentioned two main areas, uh, one online research and, and contracted research. And, and I know, Lindsay, she's wonderful. I've, I've worked with her myself. Let's explore the online research uh, in more detail. Um, what are some of the best sources for conducting genealogical research online? And what are some of the best practices, well, as well as some of the pitfalls uh, to avoid in this process? Well, that's a great question. You know, today, so much information is online. And there are, you know, all you have to really do is start with a Google search to start finding things that might interest you in your family background. But there are obviously websites that are dedicated to this. Our website is, uh, as I've mentioned, AmericanAncestors.org. But your viewers will, our viewers will be familiar with Ancestry.com, Family Search. There, there are a number of others, and uh, so uh, they have uh, collectively billions of records, uh, which users can access and begin the process. They're all a little, all of these websites are a little different from each other. And the way we work, which is different from Ancestry.com and others, is we really work with our members. We want to be able to help guide them in their research, be available for questions. Um, and so that's a little different. Many of these websites are self-serve. So you have to go in and do the exploring all by yourself. Um, so, so that that is really the landscape in which we find ourselves. Um, the and that's a great upside that there are so many resources available now online. The downside is that bad information is all over the place online, and so it is very easy for anyone who is an inexperienced or new researcher to fall into the trap of. Uh, looking in a web, at a website and finding information that is just not correct. And, um, and frankly, there may be as much bad information for genealogy out there as there is good information. So one of the biggest pitfalls is to avoid making the mistake of simply believing what you see. So, so in, in online research, you have to really become a sophisticated user. Uh, one of the things we recommend is take an online course or a seminar so that you know how to do this work, you know how to analyze records, um, because it's very important that you, you be able to differentiate between materials that are sound, that are primary sources, and materials that have been what we would describe as member submitted or uh, simply uh, lines that people have put up online, uh, and they might believe are correct, but are speculative or incorrect. So one of the things we do is a lot of corrective work. When we work with our members, we'll often take a look at what they've put together online, and as, as I like to say, we, we, uh, we giveth and we taketh away. And so we provide, sometimes we provide whole new lines, uh, but we might take away information. And I've had this in my own family, there, and there are many famous cases of it. For example, I have a, a, a family named Drake, and the, the belief for many, many years, for decades, was that we were all related to Sir Francis Drake. Well, that's not correct. And yet, if you go online, you'll still see everyone trying to connect to Sir Francis Drake. So, so it's very important to that the person doing this online really think about authenticity and accuracy and have a lens out there to evaluate the caliber of the material that they're using. I, I can uh, speak to sort of the richness of the American Ancestors uh, online site. It's a literal treasure trove uh, of information for people who are interested in doing their own online genealogical research. The, the, these, op, these online opportunities are clearly really interesting, Brenton. Uh, how does this compare to the contracted research? How, how, could you explain uh, the contracted research process and, and how you should decide whether to pursue that approach or not? Well, that is, that's a really good option for people, especially someone who is not a seasoned researcher. Uh, for example, we have a team of genealogists who every day undertake this work for clients all over the country. 
And what's great about it is that we can gather the stories, we can document the lineages, we can really bring the genealogy to life. But most of all, it's authenticated. You know what you're getting is correct. And, um, and I think it's very important for someone considering contracted research uh, to look at an institution like ours, and, and there are others, but uh, find a reputable organization that provides services that it stands behind. Um, there are a lot of practitioners out there, and, uh, and it's hard to know if a private individual is going to give you as good a result as, say, our research team uh, does. So, so I recommend contracted research as a way of helping advance a family, an individual or a family's interest and producing something of lasting value. You want uh, your family to be able to look at this and know that it's correct and authentic and it has been fully vetted and carefully analyzed uh, by an expert. And the other great thing about it, Hans, as you know, having been a client, is that uh, the genealogists know so much. They, can, they have a command of the data that it would take the layman years to acquaint themselves with uh, the number of sources that one of our staff genealogists just simply knows. So you get great value for money. You get in an hour with a genealogist what might take the layman months or maybe never able to produce. Um, so that's another benefit of contracted research. And, and that's a service we're really proud to offer and that people enjoy. And as I say, it can range from just doing research all the way up to producing a book. And I like to tell families it is the most unique, most special gift you can give your family because it is each family has a unique story and a legacy to preserve and pass down. And by doing this, uh, you are assembling something that in a hundred years, your descendants will thank you for having done. It's true. It's the gift that keeps giving. And, and Brendan, I can speak to that, uh, that detailed work that uh, the researchers do. I, I, when I got some of the work back uh, and reviewed it, I, I was really impressed with the 360 degree approach that they took to the analysis. It's almost forensic in its nature. Uh, you know, linking uh, land deeds to, to families to, to as, as proof of relation. I would have never thought of that, but, but that's the type of uh, granularity uh, that your folks go into in, in this background research. So it, it really is quite impressive indeed. Well, thank you. I'm glad you had such a great experience with it. So Hans, I have a question for you. What did you find most rewarding in having your research done by our staff? Well, I think it was, Brendan, a bit like a, a Cracker Jacks box. I, I knew I was going to get something interesting, uh, but the prize that came out was, was really kind of uh, 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 very surprising indeed. Um, originally, uh, I had contracted uh, with the American ancestors to do some research in one part of the family for uh, a, a colonial society that I was interested in. And it turned out in the process of research, uh, they found a line of my family, a line going back to the Mayflower. And in truth, I had heard as a little boy, my grandmother tell me that we were Mayflower descendants, but I never really believed it. There was no proof. Uh, no one knew who the ancestor was or ultimately how we got from where we are today to, to then. But sure enough, uh, the folks at American Ancestors made the link. And uh, my 11th great-grandmother was one Mary Chilton. Uh, Mary Chilton was a 13-year-old who came over from um, um, Holland, um, before that, England. She, she and her father, James, who was also a Mayflower passenger, uh, were from Canterbury. And um, Mary, as it turns out, as lore would have it, was the first pilgrim to touch uh, foot on um, Plymouth Rock. Probably the reality is that's not true, but the real story is, uh, you know, that happened a few days earlier. 
uh, and it was one of the, the earlier parties, but um, uh, she probably was the first woman to step of the Pilgrim Party to step foot on Plymouth Rock, that I, I would believe. Uh, and she ended up marrying uh, one James Winslow, uh, who was the brother of Edward Winslow, who was one of the governors of uh, uh, Plymouth Colony. So uh, quite, a, quite a significant uh, surprise. It was the ultimate Cracker Jack prize, if you will. Um, the odd thing, Brenton, is, is that I have walked past my, great, my, my 11th great-grandmother's grave almost daily for years and years and years and, and never knew it. She's buried in King's Chapel Graveyard in the center of Boston. And, and uh, years ago, I lived right up the street from her. And uh, it just uh, gives you a sense that the world is indeed very, very small. That's terrific. Yeah, it was it was the ultimate surprise, I have to say. Uh, you know, Brenton, when when we think about, you know, the different ways that uh, um, people use this, uh, for, for me, it was originally uh, for a colonial society that I was interested in. But but could you speak on some of the ways, the best ways that you've seen people uh, use the results uh, that, that you find for them? Sure. Well, you know, that's the great thing about this, is that there are a number of ways the results are meaningful and important. And, you know, first and foremost, I'd say, many of our members say, this is something I want for my children and grandchildren. And there's this wonderful bonding. And like at Fiduciary Trust, we work with grandparents, parents, and children. And we want to uh, provide opportunities for them to uh, enjoy these stories together and, and create a legacy. So that's, a, that's certainly one that is very important. But there are other things. Uh, you mentioned, for example, joining a hereditary society. And many of our members want to document, whether it's a Mayflower lineage or someone who served in the revolution, or even to document someone who served in the Civil War or in World War II to commemorate some important event in the family history. That, that's another important objective. Um, one of the things that, that and I, in non-pandemic times, I go around the country and often speak at family reunions. And some families use this as a way of bringing no, more than just their immediate family together, but cousins, and having a reunion and producing charts or a book uh, and and finding uh, finding an opening up or renewing relationships that can be important and and then the final thing and and i 've said it a couple of times, what I tell people is oftentimes they 've gathered materials for a family and and in some cases so many materials that they may be the world's expert on that particular family. And so I tell those people, it is so important to publish. And one of the things you can do with us is to have an article written. You could write an article yourself or have one written on a particular family or a breakthrough that you've made or publish a book. And that's a way to create a lasting legacy. Um, for other people, it might be to create a family collection. You might uh, bring all of the family papers together, the archives, the photographs, and create a what really is a time capsule of the family for the future. So there are a lot of ways in which people use this, and we enjoy exploring those with, with, uh, with uh, people of all different backgrounds. Brendan, I couldn't possibly agree more the notion of, of your family history being a, a gift that you can bestow to future generations. Indeed, that is one of the, the motivations that I have in doing my family's work. Interestingly enough, we Mer Americans are all from somewhere else. We don't have sort of the history that um, you know, uh, the citizens of Europe or Asia have, where if you ask someone there you, for generations and generations, for, for hundreds of years, uh, they would have been in those communities. And, and it's not like that here. So they, we don't have a sense of history and, and, and continuity as Americans as some of the Europeans and, and Asians do. So this is a, a wonderful gift that we can, we can give to future generations. 
So now, uh, Brenton, let's let's uh, turn our attention to some of the questions submitted in advance uh, from our viewers. Uh, the first is uh, it relates to information security. Who owns the DNA and, and ancestry data, and, and what are the risks of DNA information on the web? Well, that is a concern uh, by people, and it you know it, the answer is that it varies from company to company. Each company has a number of options that you can uh, examine, uh, ranging from, I want this information only to be used by me and not accessible to anyone else, and not to be used by that company in other testing, or you can open it up a little bit more and let other people uh, know your basic DNA profile, uh, or you can, uh, as I say, opt out of any other um, uses of your test data. But what I tell people is I haven't, I am not familiar with any cases of DNA information used in genealogy being misused. Um, and if you think about it, your DNA is already all over the place. Every time you go to the doctor's office or to a dentist, indeed, every time you hold a, a glass of water or uh, touch a doorknob, you're leaving your DNA uh, all, all the time in a multitude of places. Um, and also, of course, with the proliferation of these tests, other family members will maybe test it even if you don't opt to, to take a test. And so connections to you are going to be made inevitably. Um, so I think it's not something people should lose sleep at night over. How does the AmericanAncestors.org site uh, differentiate itself from other sites like Ancestry.com? Well, thank you for asking that. You know, what we really are proud to do is to give very personalized experiences, almost bespoke experiences. We are a relationship-oriented organization, um, and uh, users of our site can engage in live chat with our genealogists all day long. So just by going to AmericanAncestors.org, you can chat with a genealogist for free just to get started or get advice in what you might do. And um, so we have some unique, very personalized offerings that are different from the commercial sites uh, that are much more self-serve. Um, so, so we're proud to, to, again, as a nonprofit, learned, organization, uh, try to put a human face on it and connect with people in meaningful ways. With the, um, with the name American Ancestors, our audience was wondering whether or not the research of American Ancestors is global and, and, and able to be accessed uh, across the world. Breton, could you touch a bit on the global impact that American Ancestors has? Well, that's, an, thank you, that's another great question. So our name, as I said, started with New England Historic Genealogical Society, and what I tell people is that's a little bit like the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a regional name, but our scope is indeed national and international. And we adopted the name American Ancestors because since 1845, we've been the premier center for American genealogy. And we wanted to have a public identity that really communicated that because our resources for the South and for the West are really very rich. And as I said at the, at the beginning of our interview, we have members in 138 countries and our collections are international. So indeed, uh, we can help people with research in many different countries. Uh, we have a special strength in the United Kingdom and Ireland, continental Europe, but we've done research in all corners of the globe, and we're prepared to help uh, people trace their ancestors wherever they may be. Our joke is that our next name is going to have to be Galactic Ancestors, because we, we've, we've kind of conquered this world. We're ready for the next one. The guardian of the galaxy. <laughs> uh, Ren, what's the most common question that people ask uh, about their, their family heritage? Well, you know, uh, that's a, a question I do get every day. 
Um, and there are really two things I'd have to say that people ask. And the first one would be, how do I get started? Um, and that's easy because now you can go online. And, and again, I welcome people to visit AmericanAncestors.org, but there are other sites too. And uh, you can uh, begin to acquaint yourself with what's out there. The other question that people or comment people make is, I wonder if I'm related to a king or am I related to a horse thief? And so there's this concept out there that um, I might make a discovery that's very pleasing, or maybe there'll be a scoundrel in the family, and people are kind of excited about that. So that's, a, that's another thing that, that I hear all the time. Well, I guess, which makes the next question is a perfect tip for the next question, which is, um, could you touch on some of the most unusual things that you've learned uh, through genealogical research? Well, uh, yeah, exactly. That is. Um, and just to follow that thread through a little further in my own family, as I tell people I'm related, on one side I'm related to bankers and on the other side to bank robbers. And by that I'm referring to the, the Dalton gang, which was a, a, a gang in the Wild West who are, are fairly immediate cousins of mine. And while I love that story and it connects me to the Wild West. I'm not sure the older generations of my family were uh, as pleased by that. But I'd have to say the most unusual thing, the most, the most powerful thing, um, and, and I've experienced it countless times, is when you help someone make a discovery that is per personally very meaningful to them. And I'm thinking of one case we had with um, every year we honor famous Americans, and one year we were honoring the filmmaker, the documentary filmmaker, Ken Burns, and we knew going in that he idolized Abraham Lincoln. And I said to our genealogists who were working on the, the genealogy we would present to him, just see, you know, there's probably no chance he's related to Lincoln, but just take a look and see if there's any connection. And sure enough, they are pretty closely related. And that just really... Um, surprised Ken Burns, and it showed the power of it. And we see this every day when people visit our building or uh, write to me after they've discovered something online, uh, that they make a connection that they didn't expect to make. And um, so, so and, and many of our viewers will, will know that because this is also done on television shows. Uh, one of the shows they may be familiar with is called Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates. And that uh, is actually filmed in the room that we're filming this in right now. And we work with Professor Gates in the genealogy for that show. And you can see how moving it is for people to make discoveries or have discoveries presented to them. And to, for me, that's the most exciting part of this. Yes, yes. I, I think that notion of connection is, is so very important. Now, there were a few additional questions submitted, but it looks like we've covered most of them in the course of our discussion today. Brenton, thank you for sharing those valuable insights on learning about one's family heritage. I hope our audience found today's discussion useful, and I appreciate the questions a number of you contributed. If you'd like to learn more about American Ancestors and its services, you can go to a special page with information for our viewers at AmericanAncestors.org forward slash fiduciary. That's AmericanAncestors.org forward slash fiduciary. At Fiduciary Trust, we help families achieve their personal and financial goals, often across generations and involving a wealth plan. If we can be of assistance, please reach out to your Fiduciary Trust officer. If you don't have one, please contact Rick Tyson. He can be reached at 617-292-6799 or tyson at fiduciary-trust.com. Thanks again for joining, and we hope you and yours are keeping well. The opinions expressed in this material are as of the date issued and subject to change at any time. The opinions in this video do not necessarily represent the views of Fiduciary Trust Company. Nothing contained herein is intended to constitute investment, legal, tax, or accounting advice, and viewers should discuss any proposed arrangement or transaction with their investment, legal, or tax advisors. Copyright 2020 Fiduciary Trust Company and American Ancestors.